Well, let's continue our worship and our journey through the book of Exodus in chapter 28, if you would turn there. And this is actually a text that connects with the the VBS theme in our week that we have before us. And for a number of years now, I've given a message the the week before, kind of setting up what we're going to be learning about, teaching this week, so that you can also be in prayer for that. And our, our VBS theme is a journey from... Genesis to Revelation, and we're looking at the, the seas of redemptive history. These are some of them. I've kind of adapted them, but we're going to actually walk through our passage in a similar format to some of the things that will be taught this week, looking at creation and Adam and this concept of representation, and then looking at corruption and judgment. What happened to this world? It was created a beautiful, wonderful world like you see, but But sin came into the picture, and there's a remembrance that we'll see in this passage. And then ultimately, thinking of Christ and the consummation. The consummation, talking about the the kingdom and the fulfillment and all that comes after Jesus comes again. But the theme of this week is a jungle cruise. And don't worry, I'm not going to have any bad dad jokes for you, like maybe a, a theme park jungle cruise. Well, this is actually a, a very serious theme, but that theme of a cruise is you're, you're moving through with some speed, and you can't stop, and you can't examine all of the, the little details in the trees like we talk about. There's some wonderful details we might want to look at that we might not have time here today, but I, I want to actually go higher. If we also talk about a cruise, like cruising altitude of a, of a plane, you get up above the trees in a higher level, and you can see the big picture of the forest. That's what we're going to do today, and this passage in Exodus takes us on a trip from Genesis to Revelation, and we're not going to be able to deep dive into every verse, but we're going to see more of a panorama of Scripture. Exodus, let me start at the end of chapter 27, verse 20, Exodus 27, 20. You shall command the people of Israel that they bring you pure, beaten olive oil for the light, that a lamp may regularly be set to burn in the tent of meeting, this is the tabernacle, outside the veil that is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall tend it from evening to morning before the Lord. It shall be a statute forever to be observed throughout their generations by the people of Israel. Now chapter 28, then bring near to you Aaron your brother and his sons with him from among the people of Israel to serve me as priests, Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, and you shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful whom I have filled with a spirit of skill that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. These are the garments that they shall make, a breastpiece, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checkerwork, a turban, and a sash. They shall make holy garments. And that's really the summary verse for the rest of the chapter. Those garments that are laid out there are going to go into more detail and we'll look at each of those in turn. But this was somewhat of an audio-visual lesson that God would have continually before us. You see a lot of visuals behind me and the the tabernacle itself was a, a visual stage and backdrop for, for Israel to see and to see things about God. And then this, this character who's highlighted here, the high priest, and then the other priests who would be serving on that backdrop, they, there was a, a message about God that was to be made through, through all of this. And if we have that metaphor of a, of a journey, and, and they're on a journey through the wilderness here, the first stop on the journey that God intended Israel to think about in this passage here, I think, is Adam and creation. There's a number of connections in this to where it all began for, for all people. It, it started when I read about God in this dark tent and place having a light that would be set. And that's how the, the whole Bible starts, isn't it? Let there be light. And even the language of evening and then morning that was used in Genesis is used here and how the first day was, and and God tells man to make things here. It's the same word make that was used in in Genesis. 
For when God made everything and God made man, it's the same Hebrew word. And what they're going to make here is for, for glory and for beauty. There's things that put God's beauty on display. There's the beauty of the, of the earth, all the different diversity and, and beauty and creation that we see shows us the creativity of our God, and, and it's all for His glory. We are created for His glory, Scripture says. And, and God's Spirit, if you remember, one of the first things the Bible ever says is the Spirit of God was involved in creation over the waters. And this is actually now Exodus 28, the first time that it talks about God's Spirit coming down and filling people to give them creativity and, and to use their gifts to give them skill and and it's, it's a reminder to me, even of thinking about some of the things that have been made here that you see, the, the beauty on display, but even how God gifts people and gives tremendous skills and creativ- creativity and abilities that some of the young people here and old and all in between who have been working together, it's a beautiful picture and reflection of God who makes us in our image and his spirit in particular fills his people to use their gifts and all the different parts come together. It's a wonderful thing. And in Exodus 28 verse 4, the word work that is used is the same one in Genesis 2 for the work of God in creation, but also Adam was called to work the, the garden. Same word that was used here in, in verse 6, if you look at it, Exodus 28, verse 6, they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet yarns. And then verse 9, you shall take two onyx stones. Gold and onyx were two things that stood out about the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2. That's what it was known for. And, and an ephod isn't known to us as well today. We don't use that word, but it's a, it's a special apron. So think about this special apron that you can kind of see. Here's a couple other ways that it, it might have looked. But it's this special apron that hangs down and covers. But when you see someone wearing an apron, it shows they are ready to serve. That's what it communicates. And the high priest, when he had this on, it was to communicate to the people as he would walk through their midst, as he would go into God's presence. He, He's there to serve, to serve the Lord and to serve them. Let's look at these onyx stones in verse 9. You shall take two onyx stones and engrave on them the names of the sons of Israel. Some, some people think the onyx that's talked about here is different than onyx today, but we've got these stones and, and they're big enough to have at least 12 names engraved on them. So verse 10, six of their names on the one stone, so six on one side, and the names of the remaining six on the other side in the order of their birth. So think the 12 sons of Jacob, also known as the 12 tribes of Israel. Verse 11, as a jeweler engraves signets, so you shall engrave the two stones with the names of the sons of Israel. You shall enclose them in settings of gold filigree, and you shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces. So these might have been good-sized stones that are on the shoulder pieces, and it says they are a, as stones of remembrance for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall, here's the point, is he's got them on their shoulders, and he would be reminded of it. He would, he would feel the, the weight of that. It says, Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord on his two shoulders for remembrance. He was to remember them. He was to represent them. And the idea there is even his burdens before the Lord. He's coming before their Lord as their intercessor, as their mediator. And, and you can think of, again, at, think of Adam and creation. Adam, in a real sense, represented many other people beside himself. And, and he, he bears, even in Scripture, he bears the, the weight and the responsibility of sin, even though Adam and Eve both sin. We have this concept of a representative head, and Aaron is to represent the sons of Israel here. And he was to remember them. His actions were impacting them, even as we think of today as Father's Day. And I so appreciate what Pastor Mark prayed about fathers, and, and we think of, actually, we have all the same human father, forefather originally. Adam is the, the father of all living. Eve is the mother of all living. And what a father does has impact, for better or worse, on those 
in his family and those who come after him. And even today, we're still feeling the impact of Adam. And it's similar with a priest in Scripture. Even those he might not be biologically related to, like people, like priests, is, is one of the statements in Scripture. The, the, how the priests would go in Israel was often so much how the people would go and how the nation would go. And so we have this theology of this covenant headship where, where there's this representative who, who represents beside himself many others and his actions, for better or worse, are going to impact those who are in the same covenant family and community and people group. So Adam brought sin to all in Adam, to all that Adam represents he brought sin. Now Aaron, to all that he represents, he's going to bring sacrifices for sin. And we'll see that more in, in later chapters. But there's this concept here. Adam brought sin. Aaron can bring sacrifice. Through Adam, our representative came death to all. But through Aaron, as priest, can come life for all those who in faith are believing and trusting in what he's going to do for them. So this is hope for Israel, but, but really what's unfolding here is hope for the world. In fact, when he first talks about a, a priesthood in chapter 19, he talks about it's for, for all the nations. And God's going to put himself on display in, in all the nations through the priesthood of Israel. And, and the key verse in Exodus chapter 9, verse 16, is that God wants his name to be proclaimed to all the earth. This was never just about these people of Israel coming out. In fact, other non-Israelites are with them from Egypt and from Africa and from a mixed multitude of, of those around them are joining them as they go. But this is hope for the world. And, and I love the New Studies and Biblical Theology book. It's called The Royal Priesthood and the Glory of God. If you want to read more about this theme, The Royal Priesthood and the Glory of God, it points out that Adam in Genesis 2.15 is given this task to work or to tend the garden, to serve Yahweh in his garden sanctuary, to, to guard, in a sense, the, the sacred space. And it, it says, we know this double command in Genesis to work and serve, combined with keep or guard, is priestly because of the way Moses uses those same terms later in the law for the priests. These two words, especially in the book of Numbers, when used together, are uniquely assigned to the Levites, those who were the priestly Assistance. And so when Aaron is given access to the tabernacle, in this language they would have picked up on, it's as if a new Adam has re entered God's garden. There's a, there's a new chance for a new start with this new representative. The first representative of all people disobeyed, compromised God's command. He failed in his task to represent the Lord here on earth, to, to rule and be fruitful and multiply and all of that. He, he failed in his role. But now God is beginning to recover and showing us there's hope to recover anew with Aaron what Adam lost. And, and this writer says, when you think about the connections between Aaron and Adam, you begin to see the original pattern of, of priesthood is a hint of how the rest of the whole Bible is going to unfold. And so I think there's both echoes of, of Eden here and there's also audiovisual previews of redemption here. And, and look at verse 34, what else the priests wore. There's a, in verse 34, a golden bell and a pomegranate. That was one of the sweetest fruits. A golden bell and a pomegranate. So it's talking about the, the hem of their garments there at the bottom. Around the hem of the robe, and it shall be on Aaron when he ministers, and its sound shall be heard when he goes into the, the holy place before the Lord, and when he comes out, so that he does not die. There is again a, a hint or an echo of Exodus. There's a warning about fruit, and there's this way that you need to do things a certain way so that you do not die. And even the, the sound of God when he was walking through the garden to Adam when he sinned hid because he, he heard the sound of, of God coming. And these priests now, they're wearing symbolic fruit. They're tending a lamp that has these symbolic flowers and blossoms, kind of like a tree. 
like back in Eden, and there's these art in the holy place of cherub. And we've talked before, the only other place cherub were seen were in the Garden of Eden. There's these cherub guarding the holy presence of God. When Adam and Eve have to go out, there's cherub there keeping them away from God's presence. Unmistakable imagery in the holy place of what was lost by sin in chapter 3. In Exodus 28, verse 42, you shall Make for them linen undergarments to cover their naked flesh. The New King James has their their nakedness. You remember Adam sinned. He knew he was naked. Adam and Eve both tried to sew together these, these garments of fig leaves. But that's a different word that's used here. Garments in Exodus 28 is actually the word that God makes garments for Adam and Eve. And they're from animal skins and their proper garments. But all of this language, all of this image should have made a a thoughtful Jewish reader in those days stop and think, I've heard all this before, and and to think back on what they had lost through their first father and what they might regain in the future from paradise. And that takes us on the next stop of our journey to corruption and Judgment. This is also in Genesis. This is the second port, if you will, second part of the journey. We think of corruption and judgment that came when Adam sinned. Verse 15 of Exodus 28, You shall make a breastpiece of judgment in skilled work in the style of the ephod. You shall make it of gold, blue, and purple, and scarlet yarns, and fine twine linen. You shall make it. It shall be square and doubled, a span its length and a span its breadth. So it's, it's about like, like this, both directions, covering the, the whole midsection and heart area. You shall set in it four rows of stones, a row of sardius, topaz and carbuncle shall be the first row, and the second row an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond, and the third row a jacinth, an agate, and an amethyst, and the fourth row a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper." Those very gems would later be listed in the Old Testament as being specifically and originally in the Garden of Eden. In Eden, the Garden of God, Ezekiel 28 talks about that. Sin forfeited the the blessings, and the world would actually be changed after a worldwide flood. So there's the fall and their corruption, and then there's this flood judgment that would totally wipe out the way the world was and even where the Garden of Eden was and all all of those blessings. Here's how Genesis 6.12 describes it. God saw the earth and behold it was corrupt. There's that word corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And so as that corruption comes, a judgment comes from God in a worldwide flood. Then you remember after that judgment, there is this picture with all these beautiful colors of a rainbow with rows of these very colors. And later, visions link these stones with how God appears in glory. Here's one vision of God's throne room, quote, like a jasper stone and a sardius in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne like an emerald in appearance. It's, it's using this very language here. And so this priest's breastplate of judgment in some ways appears like God's throne of judgment. It's communicating something about God's presence when there would be visions of it later. And how God's people can enter it. And even the, the colors that were on display, and even as you think about when you see a, a rainbow, we're told there in Genesis 9 to remember God's promise to never bring judgment by flood again. God gives the rainbow not to be a symbol of pride, but to be a, a picture of his, to symbolize his promise When we see the rainbow, we're to think of his promise, his promise, his grace. And we know we're in the middle of Pride Month. In fact, last Sunday while I was preaching, there was a Pride Parade, all kinds of rainbow flags down in Sacramento. Just yesterday I read in the Sacramento Bee an article talking about how 
how when Christians ask, you know, do you believe in Jesus to those who are flying those flags, that that is harassing and that's attacking. And so this is, this is the world. This is just not far from here what is going on this month. But God says what the rainbow is to be all about. And, and, and we need to recognize it is about God's promise and God's covenant grace. And it's grace for sinners like us. It's grace for anyone who knows they need grace. Grace that we all need. And the, the love that only God can give and the love that God alone defines. We need to be loving and we need to speak truth in love about God's grace that we need to all people because we are no better as sinners. Sin corrupts our desires. Sin corrupts desires for sex and for the same sex or to think you can change your gender from your birth sex. That's all Romans 1 talks about that. It is pride for man to think he can override the creator's design. But we need to recognize our pride does that in various ways as well. Pride goes before destruction. Scripture says God is opposed to the proud, but don't miss this. There is grace for the humble. There's grace from our God. And it's grace that can change us, that can transform us from the inside out. We need to love and share that grace and help people understand we all deserve judgment for our sin. But in this passage here and, and all through Scripture, there is this picture of how a representative can actually bear the judgment for someone else and can wear it for them. And in verse 21, these multicolored stones have the names of 12 tribes, but it's, it's representing all of God's people. Verse 30, and the breastpiece of judgment you shall put the Urim and Thummim, and they shall be on Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. Thus Aaron shall bear the judgment of the people of Israel on his heart. Here's one portrayal of how this, this might have looked. This is the, the heart of God for all his people. And it mentions the Urim and the Thummim. I'm, I'm not exactly sure what those were, and neither other smarter guys than me who I read, but it seems like something to discern God's will before Scripture was written to show us God's will. But it might be hard to, to be sure how all of this applies to us today because we don't, we don't have a, a priesthood like Mormonism. We don't have secret ceremonies or special undergarments. Uh, you know, we don't, we're not like we have to go to a confessional booth to a particular person like Catholics that we need as a go-between between us and God. I don't wear collars like them or Lutherans or Episcopalian priests. And so we might wonder, do we, do we need, I mean, is this important for us today? Or maybe a more fundamental question is, do you need a priest? Do you need a priest? You may think no, but you actually totally need a priest. You absolutely need a priest. It's just not Aaron. And it's not a mere human. The priest we need every day, every hour, is not here on earth. Here's what Hebrews 4.14 says. We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. So this is the last stop of the journey I'm most excited about, and that is Christ and the consummation. This takes us all the way to the book of Revelation, but we need to understand Aaron was not great, and he didn't do so great. Just three chapters later, we're going to see his great sin with the golden calf. He's leading that rebellion. He's not leading his people rightly any better than Adam did. There's going to need to be another from among the people, another with greater glory and beauty than, than anyone else. And in Exodus 28, verse 1, mentions Aaron and his sons. They would be from among the people, that's the phrase, in order to serve as high priest. But here's what Hebrews 5, 1 says, Every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters pertaining to God. And it says he is able to deal gently. A high priest was to be dealing gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. Verse 4, Hebrews 5, No one takes this honor upon himself. You don't just volunteer 
raise your hand to be a priest. He says, he must be called by God just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming high priest, but God said to him, today you are my son. And it goes on to give this one of the most quoted verses in the New Testament from the Old Testament. You are a priest forever. That's from Psalm 110. A priest forever, not the, the high priest who would die. In fact, several of the times high priests have talked about until the year that the high priest dies. But this would be a priest who would be forever a priest, who would continue beyond his life, would be raised from the dead, and he, and he would not be like those Jewish priests who had to deal with their own sin, who had to bring sacrifices for their own sin before they could do anything for others, or who would die off after a temporary ministry in a greater way. God's son, think about this, he, because he was also fully human, he can deal gently and more sympathetically and more graciously than any human being ever could with our weakness, with our wandering, with our wonderings. Here's an old hymn says, A better high priest is come, supplying Aaron's place, and taking up his room, dispensing life and grace. Aaron couldn't do that, but Jesus does. The law by Aaron's priesthood came, but grace and truth by Jesus' name He once temptations knew of every sort and kind that he might mercy show to every tempted mind. Is your mind tempted here? He's got mercy. He knows what it's like to be truly tempted fully. Our priest abides and pleads the cause of us who have transgressed the laws. We need that every hour. We need someone who is continually pleading and interceding and who is representing us at the very right hand of God. He finished his work. He is sitting down, but he is living forever. And the fact that he is sitting shows that his work here on earth is done, but he's not done being a priest. He is continually representing us and interceding us before the throne. So the accuser can say nothing against those who he represents. And so you see, this is, this is much bigger than what Aaron and his descendants knew and, and what they wore actually points to something beyond earth to heaven and it points to the priest that we need who is there. Exodus 28, verse 6. They shall make the ephod of gold, of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and of fine Twine linen, that's the very same material in the holy of holy place. That's a picture of heaven, and it's pictured on the priest. Look at verse 12 again. You shall set the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of remembrance for the sons of of Israel. And it says this, Aaron shall bear the names before the Lord on his two shoulders or remembrance. And, and they might not have fully grasped that at the time, but as the Old Testament unfolds, we begin to see prophecies like, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his, what? His shoulders. He's going to have shoulders strong enough for rulers and for nations. And, and other things like this, Jesus said, if one sheep wanders off, the shepherd goes after that one sheep and he, he grabs that one that is going astray and he places it on his shoulders. And he bears them and carries them and it talks about how there is great rejoicing in heaven as the shepherd puts on his shoulders his own. Jesus bears the weight of his people. Jesus bears their burdens. Jesus remembers our concerns before the Father. So behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his, what? His shoulders, his shoulders. Think of God the Son not sparing, and how on the cross my burden he was gladly bearing to take away my sin. That should make us sing from our souls. How great is our great high priest? How great is our great high priest? And there's more in verse 21. There shall be twelve stones with their names according to the names of the sons of Israel. They shall be like signets, each engraved with its name for the twelve tribes. And then verse 29, so Aaron shall bear the names of the sons of Israel and the breastpiece of judgment on his heart. 
It mentions that twice. On his heart when he goes into the holy place to bring them to regular remembrance before the Lord. as before Yahweh. One writer points out how this heart language actually stands in contrast to earlier in the story. Remember there was someone else's heart who was hardened. He hardened his heart. God judicially hardened his heart against the Hebrew slaves. Yahweh, as he delivers them from that hard-hearted Pharaoh, wants them to have a leader who has a heart that is tender to the concerns and the needs of his people that he brings before them to represent and reflect God's heart, which is the complete opposite of Pharaoh's heart. This priest would bring the concerns of the people before Yahweh upon the breast peace, and, and even to think of specific people and specific tribes and all of them. And so these, some of these sections and, and these images might seem a little mundane on the surface, surface, but there's heavy theological message here. And Israel is being served by this, but this is ultimately for the world, the story of the nations to us. This is the heart of the gospel to come. Jesus bears judgment on himself, judgment for sinners that we deserve to make us sons so that his name would be remembered and, and on display. In the burning bush, God said, Yahweh is my name to be remembered throughout all generations. Now in Exodus 28, verse 29, the names of Yahweh's people are also to be brought regularly throughout all their generations to remembrance to the Lord. The New Testament says every believer has his name written individually, his name written in heaven. And it's a name that will never be blotted out. And, it, and they're never forgotten. They're never forsaken. The Lord who never loses track of a single star in this universe, stars that we will never even see, he knows them all by name and lose, never loses track of any of them. He knows the very hairs on your head. That's the level of detail. He knows and he cares and he will never lose his own. And so as you remember the name of the Lord. Remember that he remembers your name. He's the king of the universe, and he, if he knows your name because you, you are in his family, what a, a blessing that is to be part of those that John 10, Jesus says, he brings and calls all his own by name, and they follow them, and he says this, I know my own. If you hear his voice and you follow him, you can know you are part of his own that he loves in that special, intimate way, even though he knows all things. To know in Scripture is this intimate love relationship. And in Exodus 28, verses 17 through 20, the names were inscribed on precious stones. These were treasured stones. And I love that picture of verse 29. He's bringing these most precious things on his heart to the Lord, to regular remembrance and it's, a, it's a, actually a picture of what God said back in Exodus 19 when he called them out of Israel. He says, I have made you my treasured possession among all peoples. He wants the world to see those he treasures, those who amazing grace had saved wretches and then made those wretches his treasured possession. That's Exodus 19, verse 5. And the, breast, the, the, the breast piece carried treasures in the bosom of the high priest, his names on their heart. And more than any precious stone, God says in Isaiah 43, verse 4, you, says to his people, you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. That's the God who explains how you can pass through the waters. I'm going to be with you. You can go through the fire. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to all who have been created for my glory, he speaks to them in this way. I think of John the Apostle, John 21, verse 20. This is how he describes himself, not by name, but the disciple whom Jesus loved, who also leaned on his breast at the supper, or on his bosom. John 1, 18, no one has ever seen God but the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father has revealed him. He's declared him. He's displayed him and explained the heart of God. And John saw himself as this beloved 
bosom friend of the Lord Jesus. He couldn't get over that, how Jesus loved them to the uttermost. In John 13 and following there, he went and he died on the cross to show and to open God's heart to all who will believe. If you repent of your sin, if you come to him and trust him as your priest and your king and your prophet and your savior and all that you need, there is life, there is love, and there is a name that you can know is inscribed. 2 Timothy 2.19, having this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord turn away from wickedness. So the saved call on Jesus as Lord, and they seek to turn away from sin. You don't need to confess your sin to a man in a booth, but you do need to confess your sins to the man Christ Jesus, the God-man, and turn from sin by his grace. And there is a robe that verse 31 talks about. You shall make the robe of the ephod of all blue. It shall have an opening for the head in the middle of it with a woven binding around the opening like the opening in a garment so that it may not tear. Look at verse 36. You shall make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet holy to the Lord. So this is now on the, on the headpiece or the headdress. There's this golden plate and it, it says, Kadosh Yahweh, holy to the Lord. You shall fasten it on the turban by a cord of blue, verse 37. It shall be on the front of the turban. It shall be on Aaron's forehead. So it's, it's apparently on the piece, but also touching his forehead. And Aaron shall bear any guilt from the holy things that the people of Israel consecrate as their holy gifts. It shall be regularly on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. This was how... People who were unholy could be accepted before the holy Lord. And this is another reason we all need a priest, because we are all unholy. But we are represented by him. We are accepted in what he has provided, not by our own garments. All our garments sweep us away, Isaiah says. The most righteous things we can do are like filthy garments in God's sight. It's not just the bad things we do. The best things we do are not pleasing in God's sight. But there is a priest and there is a robe that God accepts and that God can look at and see that this is the proper attire that I have provided. There is a way to be accepted before the Holy Lord if a representative bears our guilt for us. And so the, the high priest is picturing this. He's wearing the right robes. He, he wore the proper robes and he bore the sin. And God saw on him written, holy to the Lord. And if he represents you, you're seen as if you are wearing his robe because he's the representative. It's like all the people in him are behind him. And, and what is seen as he represents them is he's wearing the robe for all of them. And he's holy and accepted by the Lord. Verse 38 ends with, It shall regularly be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. You know what Ephesians 1 says? It says, Before the foundation of the world, God chose us in Christ that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption. And it says this, that we can be accepted in the beloved son, in the one that he loves, we can be accepted. And so I like how A.W. Pink says, believers in Jesus, the Holy One, are represented by him and accepted in him because of our legal and vital union with him. His holiness is ours. So he says, Christian, look away from yourself with your 10,000 failures and, and look to that golden plate and what God sees for all those represented in Christ that you are considered righteous and holy in the Lord. That's what he sees. That's the measure of your eternal acceptance with God. 
It's not about what you've done. It's about what someone else has done for you in your place who represents you and he sees you in the representative. And so in the Old Testament, all this imagery of Exodus 28 turns into prophecy of salvation in Christ. Listen to Zechariah 3. You can look at this later. In fact, R.C. Sproul has a wonderful book called The Priest's Dirty Clothes. But here's where it comes from. It's a vision of, quote, the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, he says to this high priest, I have taken the iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. And so they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And then it says this, behold, the prophet says, I will send. God says, I will send my servant, the branch. That's a title for Messiah. He says, behold, pay attention to this because I'm going to send Messiah. I'm going to send Christ. And what you're seeing here is what he's going to do. Behold, on the stone, I will engrave Its inscription declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. Think of the day that Jesus died and that God was satisfied with what he did. How God took away sin for all who would believe. It's like we have sin-stained garments. Even the high priest himself, the most holy one of Israel, was not good enough on his own in his garments. But God takes away our sinful garments, and God clothes us as Jesus, his great high priest. He takes away, it's the great exchange, he takes our sin and our righteousness, and he covers us with the very righteousness and the holiness of Jesus himself. If you've never understood that before, that's what the gospel is all about. That's how God can be just and can actually justify, declare us righteous, because there's a real righteousness that he sees, but it's not our own. It's another. It's the high priest for us. And not only does he save us and allow us to come into his presence, he makes sure that we're going to get all the way to the consummation, to the end. And so turn to Isaiah 49 to see how what the priest wore and bore and carried is, is all about Jesus. And this whole section of Isaiah is, has much to say about Christ to come. It starts out with comfort to God's people. It announces Isaiah 40, the good news, and it says, like a shepherd, he will carry his people in his bosom, or close to his heart, as some of them say. Isaiah 46, verse 4, also extends that from not just little ones to even to your old age, I am he, and to gray hairs, I will carry you. I will bear, and I will save And all with gray hair said, amen. Amen. You don't have to say amen, but wonderful truth. Look at Isaiah 49, verse 16. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. We we sometimes talk about knowing something like the back of your hand. This was kind of their way to say that. Like the palm of my hand, I know you and I have engraved you. It's like you individually are engraved. This is metaphorical language, but it's giving the picture here. Like God is never going to forget you. In fact, the verse right before that says, I, it ends with, I will not forget you. That's his love. It's like your name is like right there before him. I think of the song, my great high priest whose name is love, whoever lives, we just sang this earlier, to plead for me, my name is is graven on his hands. My name is written on his heart. Think about that, Christian. I know that while in heaven he stands, there's no tongue that can bid me to depart. Is that good news? I mean, what a great, great high priest we have. How great is our great high priest? Look at chapter 61 of Isaiah, and I love this imagery of his love in Christ. Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself, listen, as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with 
jewels. Apparently, even in weddings in Israel, there was something of this captured with a, a special garment that was put on the head of the, of the man, even to, to represent this. And, and the, the bride is adorning herself with jewels. And in some way, all this language is being used now of salvation in Christ. And I know this is about Christ because he quoted this chapter in the synagogue in Nazareth, and he said, it is fulfilled in your hearing. Look at verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news, that's gospel, to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance to our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. You've heard of beauty for ashes, but fill it out with this picture, like a beautiful headdress of one holy to the Lord and accepted in Him. The oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. Those first couple of verses, Jesus opened the scroll. It was brought to Him in the Nazareth synagogue where He grew up. They knew Him as Joseph and Mary's son, and He reads this scripture. He folds it up, and He says, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. In other words, that's me. I'm fulfilling this. I am this one here. And, and the, he talks about the garments, the oil for the lamp, the beautiful headdress a priest would wear. It's all pointing to Jesus and his good news for sinners who will recognize they need that and his grace for sufferers and what he grants to grievers. Did you notice that language here? But You've got to see that you need him and the people in that synagogue didn't. But how great is our great high priest he frees the captives. He sets people free from bondage they've felt like they've been in in their whole life. He breaks the bonds that we feel like we cannot break ourselves out of. He can turn pain into praise. How great is our great high priest? And so let's close in the book of Revelation because this literally goes from Genesis to Revelation from creation to consummation, what was inscribed in small scale on garments is actually going to be on a massive scale on gates above the very precious stones of paradise that were on the priests are actually going to be on a consummate paradise city. This is the culmination, the completion of all of this in a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. Revelation 21 verse 12, it had a great high wall with 12 gates and at the gates 12 angels and on the gates the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed just like it was back in Exodus. And then verse 14, and the wall of the city had 12 foundations and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles. So think of those who founded the church so this clearly represents us. Verse 16, the city lies four square, its length the same as its width. That's just like the high priest's breastplate. He described it as that same, those same kind of dimensions, but this is just a much bigger scale. What was on that small gold plate becomes something that's on massive gold pavement for thousands of miles. In verse 19, listen to this. The foundations of the walls of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx. And you get the idea. These are the same stones that were shown in the beginning that were on the high priest and on his heart. They're now, it's bigger and it's better. But all that was pointing to that. And it's not just talking about a place here. It's talking about a, a people Verses 9 through 10 says he's showing them the, the bride of Christ. So I think there is a place, but this is also showing the beauty of those who are in Christ. Look at chapter 22, verse 4. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. It's as if to say we're going to be eternally seen as his, as those who belong to him, as those who are holy to Yahweh. The high priest had the name on his forehead, but now all believers have and can see much more than that what no priest ever did. They get to see God face to face. And whatever symbolism is here, this is the consummate vision at the close of the world 
And I want to close with the statement of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews has whole chapters about how great our high priest is. But the theme is it's about the beauty and glory of Christ. It's about the sufficiency of Christ. It's about the sympathy of Christ. Listen to this or look as I read. Hebrews 4, 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. This should motivate us to hold fast For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. How great is our great high priest. Let me just end by reading chapter 2, verse 17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. How great is our great high priest. Amen. Amen. Let's pray to him. Our great and gracious God, we come to you in the name of the Holy One, the one who is our prophet, priest, and king, the one who has done all of this, all that it points to. And it's all because of him that we can be here and want to follow you. And I I pray if there's any here who have not yet understood the reality of what salvation is and their need for another, that they would look to Jesus and Jesus alone to save them, that they would even speak with those who know Jesus around them or to a brother and sister, ask for prayer, what any spiritual need that people have, Lord. We thank you that Jesus is sympathetic. He understands. We thank you that you've also given us his people to help point us to Jesus. So I pray you'd help us to do that even today for the glory of our great high priest, we pray. Amen.